I was asked to share a story about a time I had faith in my life and also a story about a time I had doubt. For me, this was a hard topic, mostly because I was scared I wouldn't know how to tell my story in front of all of you. And that is one of my doubts. The first story I want to share is about a time I had doubt for a long time. I still have trouble with this. A couple of years ago, I was upset because I struggled to do what other, all the other kids could seemingly do more easily, mostly in my dance classes. Most of the time, I would feel like it was too hard and I was letting everyone down, the kids in my class and my dance instructor. I tried to tell my parents that dance is too hard and that I wanted to quit. I remember my parents telling me that I was making a big mistake and that I can't just quit when something gets hard. My parents told my grandparents what was going on and they talked to their other friends. Soon I had people that I knew and the others that I didn't know coming to tell me what a big mistake I was making. My parents told me that I should at least try to make it to the end of the school year. Ultimately, they said it was my decision whether to quit or not, but they strongly urged me to stick with it. They told me that anything in life worth having or achieving requires constant effort. I was reminded of a biblical movie I remember, I remember at an early age. It was called Prince of Egypt, and it was a story about Moses. Like me, Moses really didn't want to do what was being asked of him. He even ran away for a time to avoid the task but God was persistent in calling him back to do his work in Egypt. It was very hard to be brave enough to stand up to the Pharaoh and ask for the freedom of the Jewish slaves. But God didn't leave Moses on his own to accomplish this tremendous task alone. He surrounded Moses with the right people he needed for help from such as Moses' brother, Aaron. In fact, God had been looking out for Moses his whole life, starting with his journey in the basket as a baby. I realized that God has been looking out for me too, for one of his many gifts to me is that he surrounded me with the people who love, support, and encourage me when I feel less than sure of myself. Soon I was convinced into giving dance another shot, and to this day I still take classes. I now love it so much that I take nine classes in different disciplines every week. My abilities have grown considerably, but I'm still tackling new challenges such as working towards point level ballet this year. This year, I have been casted into one of the leading roles in our dance school's recital next spring, and I'm very excited about it. Dance has given me confidence and really, um, relationships I really enjoy. I don't know what I would have done if God hadn't sent the people who have helped me through this time of self-doubt. For it is through my family support and encouragement that I was able to learn that I would get better if I just had faith in myself and trusted that God would see me through the difficult challenges of pushing myself to achieving goals such as this. Speaking of the people God has spent into my life, my family has been the greatest factor in developing my faith. They are always there for me when I most need them. My parents have been making sure, bringing me to church ever since I was little as a part of my faith. They have taught me about faith in God and that Jesus by examples and through and how they live through their lives and in their words when they teach me about life. They help me grow my faith at a young age by bringing me to Sunday school Bible, for Bible studies and worship in church. I also started coming to our church vacation Bible school each summer for a time I was a baby. I spent a considerable amount of time here at St. Avenue's, St. Avenue Presbyterian Church growing up. My experiences here and the people that God has filled this church with have tremendously influenced my developing faith. I have witnessed God's loving nature in the caring of Sunday school, Lighthouse leaders, BBS volunteers, and now my youth leaders, who I am very grateful for. I must admit, I had struggled to come up with good examples to tell of my experiences, 
with faith and doubt. When preparing this sermon, my mom encouraged me to tell you about the, er, my earliest memory of being a part of our church. I resisted at first because it was time when I was just a little kid. My mom continued to urge me to share it, so here it goes. When I was three years old, I got to participate in Vacation Bible School kids program for the first time. It was so much fun. I loved doing the crafts, getting to sing songs, playing with the other kids, and eating the creative snacks. It was great. It was the only place you could actually play with your food and turn it into a craft. Before going to VBS that year, I knew that Jesus had been on earth and that he was in heaven, but I really never put it together that he had to die to get to heaven. Remember, I was only three years old at the time. The first day of VBS, the teachers taught me how Jesus died for our sins. On the ride home that day, I started crying. When my mom asked me what was wrong, I replied, Jesus was my best friend and he died. When preparing for this sermon, my mom reminded me that I cried every day of that VBS week. After coming home, though she told me it was okay because Jesus was in heaven and looking over us and that we keep him in our heart. On Sunday following the VBS, she told Dr. Frampton about this, who said, more people should cry about that. That was the beginning of my faith story. I admit I was a bit scared to tell it because I'm worried about what all of you would think or say about this childish story. I am now almost a teenager, so I do spend a lot of time really thinking how other people will think of me. What I need to remind myself of is that I should mostly value what God and my family, who he lovingly surrounds me with, think of me more than anyone else. After all, I know that both God and my family love me unconditionally and have always have my best interest at heart. As I am wrapping up my time with you today, I want to remember the lessons of Moses and what wonderful example he is for each of us and to think about. He was a man full of self-doubt and wanting to quit. But God kept sending family and other ordinary people into his life to help him answer God's call. God's love and encouragement allowed ordinary people to do extraordinary deeds for their faith. Remember that why you might, may feel extraordinary yourself to someone else, you might be an extraordinary gift that God has sent from them to do his work. Let your faith be stronger than your doubt. Hello. When I was asked to give this sermon, Andy asked me if I could write something pertaining to doubt, and immediately I was like, yep, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, because high school has been the first time in my life I can remember in which I truly began to doubt. You all probably know this, but high school is quite a stressful time in life. I think, though, that every stage of life is stressful in its own way. Young adults grapple with the uncertainty of the future, middle-aged people deal with the problems of raising a family, and the wisest folks deal with retirement and grandkids and whatnot. So, in fact, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, 18.2% of the American population, that's 42.5 million Americans, suffer from some form of mental illness. And the most, pr most common illnesses, such as depression and anxiety, are born primarily from at least some form of self-doubt. And from experience, I know how crushing it feels. And if we doubt ourselves, how are we expected to have full faith in God? Now I know many of you may be thinking, what's this kid doing up here trying to talk about struggles and hardships? I walked to school uphill both ways in the snow. <laughs> and while I usually would agree, I, would, <laughs> I also believe that this would be a little bit more meaningful if you would just follow me here and understand that I've dealt with some tough problems. Also, if your said childhood took place in New Orleans, I would ask you to see your doctor for hallucinations because <laughs> New Orleans has neither hills nor snow. <laughs> Speaking of snow, has anyone here seen the TV show Gilmore Girls? Yeah? It's a great show. <laughs> well, in the show, one of the two main girls is this sweet teenager named Rory, and her first boyfriend in the show is this super nice guy named Dean, and watching those early episodes, it gave me hope because I was like, oh, a nice guy who's actually appreciated for being a nice guy. <laughs> Maybe there's hope for me. But 
as we all know, of course we can't have nice things. <laughs> Enter Jess, a 2004 rebel without a cause, and of course Rory is smitten by his ways and Dean falls to the wayside. And Dean was very confused, much how, like how many people, including myself, become confused like when I see someone else being favored over me by my friends or by a girl I might have been interested in or whatever. I was once told by an instructor that all unhappiness is caused by comparison. We compare ourselves to others, we become disgruntled and bitter about it, but the thing I've realized recently is that you have to accept uh, what's happened and proceed with the faith that things will improve. Every one of us doubts ourselves and doubts God to some degree, but without doubt there cannot be faith. And it's been the same in my journey with God. We have times where everything goes right. Everyone is great and the pieces just come together exactly as they should. But we also have stretches where nothing goes right. Where the entire universe seems to be giving us a collective swift kick in the rear. And I, in these times I doubt God, questioning why these things would happen when I try my best to help people and be a good person. But self-doubt is crushing. It's paralyzing, debilitating, and crushing. One thing that's helped me overcome my doubt is now every once in a while, I'll ask God for little signs when I'm feeling doubt roll in. I don't know how many other people do this. Maybe I'm the only one, but it's astounding to see when you ask for a sign, more often than not, you're rewarded. Some people go to strict scripture for extra faith, and as an actor at NOCA and a Presbyterian of this church, my two constant forms of gospel are the Bible and Shakespeare. And of course, good old William has something to say about self-doubt and measure for measure. Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we might oft win by fearing to attempt. As a notoriously amiable and passive person to many of my friends, my self-doubt stands in the way of some of the good I might oft win. But sometimes the faith isn't given to you and you need to make your own. A little push can go a long way. A battle between faith and doubt has been waged in the minds of countless individuals throughout all of history. It can be hard for some to grasp the concept of the unsubstantiated and accept that it exists. That's where I found myself during my eighth grade year. My name is Tonner Doherty. I'm a junior at St. Paul's School in Covington. I'm 17 years old and I have an unhealthy fascination with science. My entire life, I've always used science to explain what I could not understand, and when it came to explaining God, I reached crossroads. It was hard for me to simply accept that God existed. I couldn't find any scientific proof that he did exist. Just as Thomas needed, needed to feel Jesus' wounds, I needed some form of tangible proof that God exists. This lack of proof and doubt drove me to drop out of my confirmation class here and spend two years in constant conflict with myself about the existence of God. I go to an all-boys Catholic high school, so I'm constantly bombarded with God. I am required to take a religion class, and I saw it as a waste of my education and time. Eventually, I stopped going to church altogether, and I abandoned God in my life. I can remember one afternoon after school ended, during my eighth grade year, when Andy Fox came all the way to the North Shore to have coffee with me so we could talk about my faith. I called Andy to tell him that I wasn't ready to be confirmed, and he decided that he would meet me face to face. He told me to write down what I was feeling over the phone so he, he could see it when we met. I wrote about a page worth of stuff explaining how for a while now I was doubting the existence of God and that it was hard for me to believe without some form of proof. He told me that everyone has doubts, not just myself. He even agreed with me that it's hard to believe in something you can't see or experience with the rest of your senses. He told me that eventually I'll find the answers I need. I ended up dropping out of my confirmation class and my doubt just plateaus until the end of my sophomore year. My sophomore year was a roller coaster of emotion. I had my first real girlfriend and she became the center of my life. We were together for about eight months and when she broke up with me, I was completely devastated. The first couple of days after she broke up with me, I wasn't eating much at all and I was just a general grouch. In religion class at school, we occasionally have mass in the chapel. Since I'm Presbyterian, I'm not supposed to participate in the celebration of the Eucharist. 
However, the day we had mass was three or four days after my girlfriend broke up with me and I hadn't eaten much of anything. <laughs> to be more specific, I was on the verge of collapse. I was that hungry. During the Eucharist ceremony, for the first time in years, I prayed. I prayed that if God really existed, that little piece of bread would completely satisfy my hunger. I know I'm not supposed to test God, but I figured believing in God again and not being hungry would be a double whammy. As the ceremony proceeded, and it was my rose turn to get in line, I was literally about to fall on my face and pass out. Somehow, I managed to reach the priest, and he handed me the bread, saying, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And apparently, you're supposed to say amen after the priest says that, and since I'm Presbyterian and not supposed to be participating in the ceremony anyways, I blanked out. The priest then looks at me, the priest then looked at me and said, Amen, in a very intense and intimidating way. And after I repeated him, I ate the bread. Instantaneously, I felt relieved of my hunger. I went from on the verge of passing out to feeling completely normal and not hungry at all. I cried right there in the pew. For the first time in my life, I had infallible proof of the existence of God. Science cannot explain how a small piece of bread with little nutritional value could completely satisfy my hunger. I was in astonishment. My world had completely been turned upside down. Science was a tool I used in my daily life, but at that moment, science was thrown completely out the window. After the Mass, I approached the priest. He was doing confessions, and this was the only time I could talk to the priest about what happened. At first, he thought I was there so he could hear my confession. I then proceeded to explain to him that God touched me in the Mass during the Eucharist. I told him how I hadn't eaten much in the past few days leading up to the Mass and how I was about to pass out from hunger. When I told him about how the Eucharist completely satisfied my hunger, he said, Bless you, my son, and agreed with me that this was a miracle from God himself. On March 22nd of this year, my life went from a life of doubt to a life of faith. My faith in God had been completely restored, and it took a miracle from God for that to happen. It was a relatively small gesture, but it means everything to me. There is no way to prove what happened to me actually happened, but I believe with my entire heart that it did, and that's all I need. Even if you feel that God doesn't exist or you're having doubts, I realize that God was with me every step of the way throughout my life. And just as he's been there for me, he is undoubtedly there for you, even if he doesn't make it known in an obvious and sudden way. Now I wholeheartedly would like to become confirmed in this church and fully become a member. Thank you.